Hello and thank you for joining us for Witness TV. I'm your host, Rachel Bryson. What do school safety grants, meeting the Pope, and funding our Catholic schools have in common? Well, these are all stories we'll be featuring on today's show. For our first story, this week we caught up with Aaron Lynch, who is a seminarian for the Diocese of Harrisburg. You might actually remember Aaron from a previous episode of Witness TV. Well, Aaron and several of his Theology 3 classmates from St. Charles Borromeo Seminary in Philadelphia recently traveled to Italy on pilgrimage. Now, the pilgrimage was part of a formation program made possible by an endowment from the late auxiliary bishop, Louis de Simone of Philadelphia. While visiting the Vatican, Aaron and his classmates had an unexpected meeting with the man in white. That's right, Pope Francis. Now, Aaron caught up with us about his experience. My seminary out here in Philadelphia, um, a, an auxiliary bishop of Philadelphia, Bishop de Simone, uh, unfortunately passed, I think about six months ago. Uh, and he left an endowment in his will to the seminary to ensure that seminarians at some point in their formation would have the ability to visit Rome. Uh, he was very Italian. He loved Italy. He loved Rome. Love the church, uh, and he loves seminarians, so he left behind, you know, something to help seminarians do that. So my class was the first class to benefit from this. So please say a prayer for Bishop De Simone for his soul and for his family. Uh, but uh, we were the first class to do this. So we're kind of like the guinea pig class. We're figuring out how this pilgrimage is going to go. So it was all very hectic. There was a lot of stuff going on. There's always uh, a lot to do there. But we, uh, you know, went through, landed in Milan, and then spent a couple days in the CC, and then we spent uh, almost a week in Rome. Uh, there was a really wonderful experience with myself and my classmates from all the different dioceses. So we knew we were going to go to a Wednesday audience. Um, so, you know, we got tickets and things to go to the Wednesday audience. And we were there to hear his exhortation. Uh, but then after the audience was done and everybody started leaving, one of the, uh, someone from the papal household came over and said, okay, stand up and follow me. I'm like, what, what's, he's like, no, stand up now and follow me. I'm like, okay. Uh, so uh, we followed him like up close to the stage and he said, okay, group tightly together and stand over there and don't move. We're like, okay. Uh, so there were a couple of groups that he had done this with. And the Holy Father came down off the stage and started going to each of the groups and was, like saying hi to them. So we were between some Mexican diplomats, uh, the Argentinian soldiers, and a circus uh, that he had come to like shake hands with and, and talk to him for just a few minutes. So I'd seen him before, but I'd never been that close to him. Uh, and when he came through to like, he actually shook every person's hand. Um, and uh, our, the priest professor who was leading us, Monsignor, uh, who speaks fluent Italian and along with like five other languages, uh, you know, started speaking to him. And he spent some time with us, uh, just a few minutes. I mean, more than he needed to, absolutely. Uh, he was very generous with his time, but he spent just a few minutes with us. And we were just kind of, we weren't expecting this. We were just kind of bewildered and, you know, really blessed to, have the Holy Father come and speak to us for a minute. Uh, and he uh, remembered his visit to St. Charles Borromeo back in 2015. He said, oh, San Carlo Borromeo, I'm uh, it, was, it was, he's very animated in person. It's really good to be that close to him, be able to say something to him. So he just, you know, thanked us for, for coming um, and just, you know, hope that we were blessed. And he knew that uh, the seminary being in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, he knew we were waiting for a uh, new archbishop who was just announced. Um, so, we, uh, you know, he gave us, you know, uh, his thoughts and prayers and said, you know, I'm, you know, mulling over who's going to be your next archbishop. Yeah. Um, but it was really, he was very generous, you know, gave us each person a rosary. And even one of my classmates that day happened to be his grandmother's 100th birthday. Uh, so, you know, he gave him a special rosary to give to his grandmother. So it was, it was very nice to be able to meet him. He particularly has a certain... I don't know, joy about him when he's out at those kinds of events. Um, it's hard to not have a big dumb smile on your face when you're standing next to him. Uh, and when he was talking to us, he had a, this kind of like bouncy joy to him, uh, just this happiness about him that was really contagious. Um, you know, it's just wonderful to be in, in the presence of the successor of Peter. Uh, and I don't know, it just made everybody happy. It kind of made everybody's day. It's like what we talked about the rest of the day. To be able to go to Rome 
uh, and even the other cities we visited, Assisi and Milan. Um, it was almost like going back to, you know, the motherland of Christianity. Because um, I remember when we were in Milan, it was the first place we stopped and it really struck me. Um, I had finished Confessions of, the Confessions of St. Augustine a few months ago. Um, and we're standing in Sant'Ambrogio. Uh, it was the cathedral that was commissioned by St. Ambrose. And the, the ambo, the pulpit in Sant'Ambrogio is the pulpit from which St. Ambrose preached. When Augustine came to the faith, it was in that church that looks almost exactly like it did when he was there. And that is the ambo from which he heard Ambrose preach. And that's what converted his heart. You're in the room where St. Augustine was converted to Christianity. Uh, and then you get to Assisi and you're walking around where like this is the place where St. Francis, you know, this is where he preached to the birds. This is the rosebush he jumped into. Um, these are the churches he built. Uh, you know, these are the sisters that, you know, followed him. This is the religious order that came after him. And then you get to Rome and it's just ramped up again. Uh, like this is the place where St. Peter was martyred. This is the place where St. Paul died. This is, you know, the church that this person built. This thing was built in the third century and it's still here and it hasn't changed at all since the third century. Um, you know, the, the, these giants of Christianity, this is where they walked. Um, at a particularly special moment, there is a small chapel with a piece of the manger in which Christ was laid at his nativity. Uh, and in that chapel, you are permitted to celebrate the midnight mass of Christmas, no matter what day it is. So we were there in Christmas time, but the mass we celebrated that day was Christmas day, um, the midnight mass for Christmas. Even though it was like a, a Wednesday or something, it was in that place because the place is so holy, because where you are is so closely connected to a particular mystery that this is the mass that you celebrate. These are the prayers that you say, because as far as we're concerned, in that chapel, it's Christmas. And in this place, this is where St. Peter is. And in this place, this is where St. Paul is. And just amazing things like that. The, the importance of the place. Uh, we're trying here at St. Charles to turn it into an annual thing. Uh, so pray for the class below me and the classes after them that uh, they have just as incredible of an experience as my class had. Uh, so please keep praying for the success of this program and pray for Bishop D. Simone um, that, you know, we actually we celebrated a mass for him uh, when we were there. Uh, so we're all praying uh, for him and for his family. So continue to pray for him and for his family and for the classes that come after me that they can benefit from the same thing that we did. Well, in addition to their pilgrimage to the Vatican, Aaron and his classmates also visited the Basilica of St. Ambrogio in Milan, where they saw the pulpit from which St. Ambrose preached. They also saw the Crypt of the Nativity, where they participated in Mass celebrated in front of fragments of the Holy Crib. In our next segment, eight Catholic schools in the diocese recently received a combined more than $147,000 in state-funded grants to enhance the safety and security of their campuses. Now, the grants were awarded through the Safe Schools Initiative Targeted Grants for Equipment, a project of the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Now, its purpose is to assist schools by providing funding for security planning, purchase of security-related technology, and training in the use of security-related technology. We spoke with our superintendent of schools, Dan Breen, and Sister Aline Marie, the principal of St. Joan of Arc Catholic School in Hershey, to learn more about these grants. We're in a state where um, education's a priority, and um, Pennsylvania just this last summer made grant opportunities available for schools, including non-public schools, to um, enhance the safety and security um, of their campus. And so I, I strongly encouraged our schools to take advantage of that. We were very blessed to find out in the fall that eight of our schools received approximately $150,000 in uh, grant money. I think $25,000 was the maximum grant that was available. And several of our schools qualified for that and or, or very close to that amount. And so, um, so they're thrilled. I'm thrilled. Uh, safety is a top priority for us, the safety of our students and staff is a top priority in our, in our Catholic schools. And so we're able then to make enhancements to campus such as um, 
keyless entry at every door, um, enhanced security cameras, um, more radios for staff to be able to communicate, uh, things like go bags um, so that when there's a, a fire drill or some kind of a, a drill, um, our staff are able to just grab a bag that has everything that they need in it um, and take it where they where they need to go um, with their students. And I can look at this as multiple levels as a veteran Catholic school principal, as a parent with children in our Catholic schools, um, and as the superintendent and secretary for education as well. So safety is absolutely on parents' minds when they uh, drop, their, drop their children off. And, uh, I mentioned even in my opening statement coming to the diocese that um, our schools will be safe and uh, that remains a top priority for me and safe means a lot of different things so certainly physical safety is something we're paying a lot of attention to and the grants that we received from Pennsylvania will be used uh, for that physical safety but we also know that there needs to be um, emotional safety for example in a school that kids need to feel safe to be themselves they need to be free from bullying and so so there's a broad definition for what safe means and so we, we take that very much to heart and work very closely um, together as schools to, to see that we're offering top-notch programs that and, and, a, and an environment a culture and atmosphere that um, is safe for our for our students and our and our families. There are best practices that we are implementing in our schools. We work very closely with local law enforcement to make sure that we have good relationships there, good communication there, and that they are very well aware of our school and our campus and um, that they are um, seeing us as a priority um, as well. The schools that received safety grants from the state are uh, Bishop McDevitt High School here in Harrisburg, um, St. Joan of Arc in Hershey, St. Joseph School in Danville, our Mother of Perpetual Help in Ephrata, Resurrection and Sacred Heart in Lancaster, St. John the Baptist in New Freedom, and York Catholic School in York. And I do want to mention that there is another state safety grant that's coming available um, and should be available any day for us to apply. And there's about $5 million available. Uh, we're great, very grateful to, uh, to our legislators who have uh, given us this opportunity and our schools are poised to apply for that and will continue to be poised to apply for these uh, opportunities when they're uh, when they're made available so they've collected their needs and they're ready to push go as soon as that link becomes available uh, for us and so we're we, uh, we stand ready. The grant process is, is pretty extensive and it requires work from, uh, from schools that already are working very, very hard. Um, and so I'm very grateful that they're willing to put that, put that time in and, and grateful to the state as well for their support of our schools. The purpose of the grant is to do anything that we can to enhance the safety of our schools. And of course, in our school, and as with many schools, safety is a priority and we take advantage of any opportunity that we have in order to promote safety within the school. And when we apply, we apply for 20 cameras and the 20 cameras will be used around the school in various places so that we can monitor 20 different areas of the school from the school office. Uh, we're also going to get six fobs uh, for doors so that we don't have to worry about keys and only legitimate people can get in using the fobs. We do have an emergency plan, a safety plan, and uh, we work on that and improve it as we see fit. Uh, we're very happy that we have the Derry Township Police involved with our school. Uh, they come and they help us with intruder drills, with fire drills, any kind of drills that we have. Uh, they give recommendations, they provide a training, the ALICE training for all of our teachers. So we do take safety seriously. And, you know, we are concerned about the safety of the students, the parents, the teachers. Uh, so we're really, that's a priority for every school, I think, today. We'd like to thank those who provide the money for the grants. You know, they certainly come in handy. And um, anything that we can do to enhance our safety is important to all of us. And nearly 130 public private and charter schools across the state received grants based on a comprehensive grant review process with a maximum allowable amount of $25,000.
Well, school choice, telemedicine, the selection of judges, and attracting young people to roles in emergency response. Al Ganoza from the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference joins us with an update on these and more issues under consideration in the state capitol. Hey folks, Al Ganoza here with the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. The PCC does the lobbying work for the Catholic bishops up at the state capitol. One of the things we work on is actually funding for our Catholic schools, and that comes in the form of the EITC program. In many cases, EITC stands for Educational Improvement Tax Credit. It gives state tax credits, mostly to businesses that donate to approved scholarship organizations. Now, not everybody is for this. Uh, the governor, teachers union come to mind very quickly, but a bunch of folks are. There's PCC Executive Director Eric Failing speaking out on behalf of School Choice. We are blessed to live in a country where we talk about opportunity, where we talk about freedom, where we talk about the ability of someone to rise from their status, what they were born into, to do anything that they want to when they get older. How can we tell our children, you have freedom and opportunity to do whatever you want to do, if we tell them what exactly and where exactly they need to go to receive an education and how that education will be presented to them and how it will be unfolded and what material they will learn. That's not freedom, it's a mandate. School choice gives parents the ability to choose what is best for their child. Now, personally, my, my wife and I, we had, a, uh, we had a boy, and I'll just get personal for a second, we were blessed to live in a very good public school district, very good ac academics, college admission rates very, very high. But we decided not to send our, our boy there. Why? Well, my wife and I are Catholics. And we knew that the local Catholic school also had excellent academics. So they were on par. But we also believe that Catholicism is not a Sunday activity. It is not something that you learn one hour a week or two hours a week. It is a lifestyle choice. And we chose, we thought, the best environment for our child to be immersed into that lifestyle choice was a local Catholic parochial school. And we're blessed, Alex, our son, went K through 12 through that, has graduated with double major degrees from Westchester University, and is now very successful in the financial field. He had the opportunity because we had the choice. We had the freedom to choose what was best for our son, what was best for our family. How dare somebody try to prevent a family from exercising that freedom and exercising that choice for their child and at the same time celebrate living in an America where we are all supposed to be free and we're all supposed to have equal opportunity. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, the governor, I don't think, was at any of our rallies. At least I did not see him. All right, one of the bills that we backed and just passed through committee was House Bill 1984 that was authored by House Majority Whip Carrie Benninghoff. It applies to female victims of rape or incest to later give birth and then we'll have protections by law. I will let Representative Benninghoff explain his measure. I talked to him right after the committee vote. Very simply, it, does no, it will no longer require that a woman has to find a surrogate parent to be the father in the case of relinquishing parental rights of somebody that raped her and had a child subsequently. We think that the sad and at times could provide opportunities for somebody to be harassed later on, especially if their assailant was uh, incarcerated and then to get out and then you want to start fighting for parental rights. Uh, I think it's an archaic log and needs changed. I'm glad that we got a unanimous vote here in the committee. All right, thanks, Representative. You know, I got the chance to interview a couple of good guys recently, uh, both legislators. First one is Representative Paul Schemmel of Franklin County, good friend of ours at the PCC. Brilliant man, he's an attorney. Uh, worked together with him on a number of issues. One such important issue is that of telemedicine. I have explained that in the weeks past. As of the time I record this, the Senate still has the telemedicine bill in its docket. 
The House passed a version of telemedicine that prohibits its use for abortion. Now, Representative Schemmel, during our conversation, he explains the roots of that prohibition and why he joins the PCC in seeing the need to keep that prohibition in any telemedicine legislation. Telemedicine is fantastic technology, and it really provides access uh, in especially rural areas to specialist doctors that a, a smaller hospital simply will never have. Uh, it's, it's wonderful technology, but there are problems with it, and part of it is our Abortion Control Act in Pennsylvania, which requires you to have an advanced meeting with the doctor who's going to perform that abortion. So it provides you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, sort of time for reflection. So a woman does not go into an abortion clinic and get an abortion the same day. The concern about telemedicine is that it could be used as a tool for physicians to have that initial consultation. So now a woman maybe calls up an abortion clinic to schedule her abortion, and while she's on the phone call, she has that initial consultation with a, with a doctor over the phone. Um, and we don't believe that that provides the opportunity for reflection. So in the house, we corrected that by taking taking you know, abortion consultations out of uh, telemedicine, so it would not be part of you know, that, which it should never, shouldn't be to begin with. Uh, we hope that the Senate passes that through, because in all other respects, you know, this is great advance for you know, providing effective medical uh, treatment for people in Pennsylvania. All right, we're not going away from Representative Schemmel. I also talked with him about a bill he has to change the way some of the judges in Pennsylvania are selected, the higher judges. He would like to see it changed to a merit-based system. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Representative Paul Schemmel. Yes, Pennsylvania does something unusual that we elect all of our judges all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, most states don't do that. They have something similar, more similar to the federal system. Maybe they elect local judges, but uh, but they have appointment an appointment system for the uh, you know the Supreme Court and the uh, higher courts. Uh, so what my bill does is it, it's actually a resolution put before the Pennsylvania electorate, everyone who votes, the opportunity to vote on a referendum so they, whether they want to have uh, an appointment system like. Like other states or the federal system or to continue with an elected system. And the, the merits of an appointed system are really twofold. Number one, you tend to have a higher caliber of candidates because some of them maybe makes a good judge, uh, isn't necessarily interested in running in a partisan election. So we lose a lot of people that would be great judges simply because they aren't interested in running in a statewide, very partisan election. But two, and really more critical, uh, by having a, a merit selection process, we're able to strip out a lot of the politics, uh, a lot of the special interest groups that put significant amounts of money into the election of a judge. And appellate court judges, and I had an individual contact me and say, you know, Paul, who are these people that are running you? Who do you recommend? Uh, I, okay, I get questions like that a lot, but the person asking me the question was himself a judge. So when you have a judge, you should really be aware of, uh, you know, who, who is running in a judicial election. Really not aware because, you know, who, who really pays attention to these. Made me think, you know, there's got to be a better way, I think, to, to have a better selection of candidates. All right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, also met recently with Representative Bob Brooks. He is a freshman rep from out in western Pennsylvania, Allegheny and Westmoreland counties. Now, he's a freshman rep, but he has done a bunch in his life. He was big in the corporate world as a financial guy. Uh, also became part owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Pittsburgh Pirates and was a part of a group that helped keep both of those teams in the area. Also went to Franklin and Marshall College uh, down in Lancaster County and gave the school a million bucks for its Shadex Stadium. Uh, nicest guy, most down-to-earth person you'll ever meet also. Uh, he talked about legislation that he supported at the Capitol that will help attract more young folks to become first responders in Pennsylvania. My area has 16 fire departments, and those fire departments are all volunteer. And one of the problems is volunteers have gone from 300,000 down to 38,000 in the last 10 years, and that's all of our fire departments in the whole state. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, we need to find ways to get young people to be wanting to be involved. So one of the programs we pass is if you're a firefighter, uh, why do you go to college? And for four years after, we'll pay your education. We'll also then take the people that are there and we'll give them a rebate on their 
uh, taxes, both the local, not the state taxes, but the local and the uh, county taxes. So in effect, it's, it's not huge pay, but it's thank yous uh, and appreciation. And so we were doing a lot of those kind of things, plus ways of helping to finance trucks and their uh, training, which they have a tremendous amount of time they have to put in training. So this has been a major effort of the legislator, and we've sent several bills to the Senate, and now we expect that'll be a, another major uh, step forward, just like trafficking is a step forward. And Brooks also had some encouraging words about the level of spirituality in his districts. Apparently, the folks around there, uh, they go out of their house on Sunday mornings. I think the whole western part of the state is still a very Christian-based community. Yeah. In Murraysville, where I live, uh, we, which is about a third of my district, we have 23,000 people, 19 churches, and they're all really doing uh, exceedingly well. Uh, my neighboring communities to the north, uh, up in the lower borough, they have several churches, uh, very heavily Catholic in that area, St. Margaret Mary, and, and several, what I love are the festivals that we have in the summer and the activities there for youth. And then as you go up into West Deer, it's more rural, and now it's all small rural churches where they have great fish fries and uh, chicken fries, uh, uh, just great ways to live life. You know, it sounds like when you take this job, you have to be, I mean, I'm sure not sure, I'm sure not everybody is, but it helps if you're a people person. You seem like you're a people person. Well, I was the mayor of Marysville for the eight years prior to that. And what that does is you spend your whole time out with the people and you're trying to make things better. What I can say is when you're the mayor, you do a whole lot better at getting things done sooner than when you're up here. But when you're up here, you're dealing with helping a whole lot more people. It just means you can't do it by yourself. You have to have groups. And so you form caucuses. And these caucuses work on special things like the trafficking uh, or like um, transparency. All right, before I go, just want to get a reminder out there. Put it on your calendars. May 18th, the Pennsylvania March for Life here in Harrisburg begins at 11 a.m at the Capitol. We are working on all the logistics. If you want more information and you want to RSVP already and tell people you're coming, you can go to our website, pocatholic.org. There's a banner across the top of the page. Uh, just click on that and you can sign up and get more information. Well, thanks, Al. That does it for us, and we hope you enjoyed this week's show. To learn more about the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference and the Diocese of Harrisburg, please visit pacatholic.org and hbgdiocese.org. From all of us at the Diocese and the Catholic Conference, thank you for watching, and have a great week.